welcome to Hey, Great Shot. This is the Great Shot Podcast, a Crack Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production. My name is Alex Gruskin. On today's show, you have a pre-recorded edition of The Deciding Point, our weekly breakdown of everything that happens in the Division I college tennis world. Of course, here on Tuesday nights on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel, we break down all the Division I women's college action that happens over the course of any week throughout the season. Now, a quick disclaimer as you heard me allude to in this introduction. This is a pre-recorded edition of the episode. I am currently traveling to Phoenix for that ATP 175 inaugural event happening there. I am sincerely hoping we get plenty of contact content, excuse me, for all of you Crack Rackets fan to enjoy from the event. I am also sincerely hoping to have a sit-down interview with Matteo Berrettini for all of you. So we'll all knock on wood. We'll all hope that happens. Nevertheless, because of the busy schedule this week at CR, we did decide to pre-record this Deciding Point episode. Wanted to make sure we had something for all of you college tennis fans. Unfortunately, we aren't able, though, to record this week's episode live. Nevertheless, we still have plenty of fun action to discuss here on today's show. Conference play starting in multiple sections of the country. You also have a few lingering spring break trip results for us to discuss. Plenty of meat on the bone as it relates to this show. And as always, we'll get into all the results. We'll talk about our newest Crack Rackets top 10 rankings. We'll talk about the week ahead as well. And joining me, as he always does to do all of that, is a returning champion of returning champions here on our Crack Rackets show, someone you know best as the co-host each and every week of these Deciding Point episodes, founder of the No Ad, No Problem blog and podcast, and our dearest friend, it's John J. Parsons. Jay, hey, great shot. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. A little thrown off by the Monday Audible, uh, <laughs> eating into my Bachelor viewing on Monday nights, but uh, happy to be of service, happy to be of beck and call, and we certainly have a lot to talk about, so I'm excited to do it. Well, doesn't The Bachelor start at 8 p.m.? It does. Okay. But there's preparations. You got to make dinner. <laughs> you know, you got to make everything. You gotta, <laughs> it's a full, full ordeal. Well, I sincerely apologize. Now, the good news is you can find all of those things on demand in today's era. That said, there is nothing That's quite true. like watching. Yeah, the I don't Bachelor. watch anything live. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious though because the Bachelor happens at 8 p.m. Eastern time, which I know you're not watching in the moment. Are you avoiding all the spoilers on Twitter in the meantime? Yeah, I have the hashtags muted. <laughs> See, this is why I love working with Jay. He thinks about all the angles. He has them covered. I apologize, Jay, for taking you away from The Bachelor. Is it a bachelor or a bachelorette season? It's a bachelor season right now. I, sh- I should know that. My Dr. Gruskin, my dear mother, a uh, longtime viewer. I think I tuned out. At, I think Jesse Palmer was my last season. So it's well, been a while for me. Well, he's <laughs> back. He's the host now. Yeah. Did you know that? You know, in another in another world... You're just telling me, like, let's say it all breaks right for me over the next 20, 25 years. Again, we'll knock on wood twice twice here to start, God willing. You're telling me I couldn't go up on stage and be like, Mackenzie, this is the final rose. And then just leave. <laughs> like, you're t- I think I would be so good in that role. And look, when they were replacing Chris Harrison, did I think I should put my name in the mix? I thought it might be a hair too early. But, like, I think that's the highest aspiration for me, Jay, is future Bachelor host. I mean, it's a sweet gig because that one line is basically all you have to deliver and then you just get to travel. That's what I'm saying. Or like, so you enjoying the Acapulco Islands? Like, (laughs) I mean, like whatever it is, like I'll figure out the questions. That's not the hard part. Um, And I'm a man who enjoys destinations. I have a passport. um, But yeah, anyways. Full circle. Yes, I did throw a curveball at you. I appreciate your uh, patience. I appreciate your willingness to work with our schedule here at CR because, of course, we have another fantastic week of college tennis to break down for all of you college tennis fans. And the reason we're able to do that week in, week out here on this show is sincerely because of the support we get from all of you. And I'm so grateful for the messages we've gotten in support of our newest Cracked Rackets broadcast, which, of course, you can find Thursday, Friday, Sunday on ESPN, SEC Network, and AC 
ACC Network Plus. Uh, of course, we've also got the Big Ten every Sunday as well on our Cracked Rackets YouTube channel. We appreciate the kind messages. We obviously are so excited to be able to shine a spotlight on Cracked Rackets, on, uh, on Cracked Rackets, uh, shine a spotlight on college tennis, as well as Cracked Rackets, I suppose, on a platform like ESPN Plus. So, of course, thank you to all of you who have tuned into that. It's only possible because so many t- of you tune into this show week in, week out. And, of course, the reason we have a show is because of the support we get behind the scenes from our friends at LS to check out the entire LS catalog. Just click on the link in the description to this show. You'll look good. You'll feel good. You'll play good. And that's all that matters. Again, shout out to our friends at LS for their support. Learn more by clicking on the link in the description to this show. All right. All of that said, Jay, we got plenty of on-court results to discuss. I do want to discuss, though, one off-court piece of news to lead today's show, and that, of course, is the announcement of the Herd Award recipients. And just a quick backstory for those of you that don't know, Mark Hurd was maybe the biggest contributor, the biggest supporter college tennis has ever had. You go to Baylor, it's the Herd Tennis Center, obviously. He alongside of Oracle, founded the Oracle Challenger Series, which provided not only Challenger events on camp college campuses, but a ton of Challenger opportunities to aspiring scholar-athletes, student-athletes with pro aspirations. Mark Hurd's contributions to college tennis know no ends. They were immense, and obviously with his passing, it was a big loss for all of us in the college tennis community, and unfortunately something he did, the Hurd Award recipient, which was a $100,000 grant to uh, players who were leaving the college ranks and beginning their uh time on the pro tour. It was a hundred thousand dollar grant to help those players it, with that transition. That herd grant went away for a couple of years. Courtesy of our friends of Universal Tennis, the Herd Award is back. And that hundred thousand grant was announced the recipients on Sunday, the two winners, Peyton Stearns and Andrew Fenty. That was the one minute synopsis version, Jay, of the background of the Hurt Award. And for what it's worth, look behind the curtain for all of you listeners. I recorded the men's show with Chris prior to recording with Jay, and I went on far too long of a spiel discussing the importance of Mark Hurt and the Hurt Award on that podcast. So if you want to hear even more, go check out tomorrow's episode. But I will just ask you now, Jay, the significance of this Hurt Award, the recipients this year, your reaction to all of it. Well, it's great to see the award back. Right, it hasn't been in uh, in cycle in three years, sure. and it's good to see um, you know Mark's heard uh, his wife Paula still involved in the process and with the support of Universal Tennis. And they have quite a crew of um, casting characters who are helping to kind of hand out this award. I mean, overall, you know, this award you know recently has gone to people like Danielle Collins, Mackenzie McDonald, who I know were there on site at Indian Wells, uh, awarding this to Peyton Stearns and Andrew Fenty. Look, I think it's great for college tennis. Uh, it is another thing in college tennis that is earmarked for Americans only, uh, which is something to note. But overall, I mean, I think this is a great, great award. It really helps um, collegians as they're transitioning to the pro tour. It's unfortunate it can only go to one person, uh, but it's uh, it's a great award to have. I thought, you know, Peyton Stearns, given, you know, the the results that she's had over the last year, sort of a, a shoe in for the award. I was certainly very surprised to see Andrew Fenty on the men's side receive this award. I wasn't even certain he still had pro aspirations after five years at Michigan. But looking at kind of the the men's options there aren't really a lot on the men's side. There are some men this year who are in their fourth year who have another year of COVID eligibility who I guess weren't yet ready to say, hey, I'm all in on turning pro after this year, the likes of Elliot Spaziri or Stefan Dostinich. But overall, I think it's a it's a fabulous award, and I look forward to this supporting both of um, Peyton Stern's already very successful start to her pro career and look forward to seeing what Fenty does after May. Yeah, look, Mark Hurd was an advocate for American tennis. If he and his family want this award to go to an American again, you'd love to see every collegiate athlete eligible for the award. But again, we're not going to we're not going to going to be upset that this award is being given out, even if it's not the exact criteria we were hoping for. No, not at uh, all. To your to your point. It is fascinating because, yeah, like, again, Peyton was the pretty clear-cut choice on the women's side. 
I was looking through the men's options, and it's like, again, how many of these players are going to go pro right away or were Americans that just went pro? And, you know, it, it's interesting because Ben right, Ben Shelton would have been the obvious choice. He doesn't need yep. it. Like, there's, you know, not that he doesn't need the money. He would like the $100,000, but there's no opportunity going to be offered by this Hurt Award to Ben Shelton that he won't have already created for himself, if that makes sense, because he's going to get into every event he wants to play on the Pro Tour based off of where his ranking is already. And so perhaps the thinking of the committee is that the grant money would be better spent by a player other than Ben, who would have been the Peyton Stearns equivalent, right, in receiving this award. That's not my read on the situation at all. Okay, go on. What's your read? I can almost guarantee that Ben Shelton did not apply for this award. Well, that's uh, probably (laughs) true as well. Like you have to apply for this award first off, but it does not seem that need is a criteria in this award. I think you can make a very similar argument with Peyton Stern. She's up to 115 in the WTA rankings, right? She's going to get into a lot of events. Um, I think she has the support and and hopefully the sponsors needed to to cushion herself. If need was a criteria, you could maybe spread this award around to players who don't have that financial resourcing. Sure. I don't really think one that's not a stated criteria of giving this award, and two, I'm not sure that that's something of interest to Universal Tennis because at that point you're taking a little bit more of a gamble, and sure. ultimately they want to bet on somewhat of a guarantee here, right? And have that nice lineage of this helping people who are going to be successful. Now you could certainly make an argument that needs should be a criteria, but I don't think that's the case. I think that's a very fair point for you to make. And again, a shout out to Peyton Stearns, Andrew Fenty, two wonderful representatives of college tennis, two people we've been fortunate enough to have on our Crack Racket shows quite frequently. I actually spoke with Andrew Fenty, a Crack Interviews podcast you can all go listen to right now about what winning this award means to him. I've also, of course, had to talk about what the Wolverines have accomplished here in 2023, a fun podcast for all of you to enjoy. But of course, you come to this episode every week to hear about the latest news in the Division I women's college tennis world. And boy, did we have a week of news, a week of results to discuss here for today's episode. Let's start with the shocking upsets because there were a couple of them throughout the course of the week. I think that's the biggest takeaway. That's the biggest headline, right, is we finally had some upsets. And by the way, that makes sense because two and a half months in, a pecking order should be starting to emerge. And when something disrupts that pecking order, it feels notable. And there are a couple of different places we could certainly start, Jay. I want to start with UCLA because you and I have been the first to jump on the UCLA is struggling bandwagons. And, you know, I think we're the only college tennis podcast out there. So I suppose we would be the first as we're the only ones discussing things like this publicly. But like, you know, again, in retrospect, kickoff weekend loss to Iowa State was not bad at all. For them to lose the follow-up match to FIU, that was the disaster. And, you know, for this UCLA team to also lose a match at Washington last weekend, not a disaster, but given the fact that they really don't have a ton of matches on their schedule and the fact that when you look at this UCLA team now, even after this win over Ohio State, which we're about to discuss in a second, they're still just 5-3 and three overall on the season. Again, we're not going to rehash what's gone wrong for this UCLA team, but there were plenty of reasons for us to have the discussion we did. Well, guess what? They're now back in the ballgame. They take out Ohio State 4-3 at home. It's a victory that sees the Buckeyes, you know, drop the doubles point as well to this UCLA team that really so many different unknowns as it relates to really every aspect of their lineup. Now, I know Waggle and Hans are a top 10 team in the country by ranking, but like where the pieces fit outside of that, where the pieces fit in singles there had been a bunch of playing around, and I think when you look you know, for this UCLA team to take the doubles point, to get three set victories at the one and four matches after being down 3-2 overall on the scoreboard, to work their way back to clinch the match, I mean, again, talk about exactly what the doctor ordered for the Bruins. We said they needed it. Jay, they got it. Yeah, they did, and it was a really interesting match because I think UCLA could be favored just because of the strength of that number one doubles positions in doubles. I'm saying they could be favored in that doubles position, 
What was interesting is a lot of these matches were extremely lopsided, right? At number two, Sydney Ratliff beats Kimmy Hance three and two. Ava Katanzarite beats Coley Allen 0 and two at number three. You know, at five and six were blowouts. Uh, Ohio State takes both of those. And so a lot of those points were off the board very quickly. And there were only two three set matches like you talked about. Uh, with Tian of UCLA and Contos at the number one spot, and then Bagramov and Boulay at the number four spot. And UCLA comes out in both of those. And particularly the match at number four with Sasha Bagramov, who is one of the most senior players on this team, one of the connective tissues to that UCLA team who made the quarterfinals in 2021. She'd been really struggling to start the year, playing her down at the five spot and still losing matches there. She came through. In this match, I know Isabel Boulay, another player who's had some struggles to start the year, but the Fagramov looked looked really good and she knew it was going to come down to her and number one and, and she pulled through. So I was really impressed by both Fagramov uh, and Tien in that performance, knowing how much pressure was on this match and the need for them to really pull out this upset. Tien's really good. Like, yeah. she's the freshman we haven't spent enough time talking about, and she's top 75 in the country for the reason. She'll probably move into the top 50 following this win over Contos. That's a really impressive three-set win. But, you know, again, I still don't know what to make of this UCLA team. Now, again, this just gets them back in the ball game, right? They're back in NCAA tournament mode. They still have the entire Pac-12 season to navigate a home-and-home with USC, a Pepperdine non-conference match on the schedule as well. You know, again, do I think there's enough there for them to be a top 16 team if they run the table with this win over Ohio State? Maybe. Like, but that's them winning, running the table, not losing another match from here. More broadly for this group, though, that is very young across the board. This is just a big win. This is a reaffirming confidence building win. And it's one, again, this program needed after obviously the disaster that was last year and the slow start to this season. On the flip side for Ohio State, look, Contos and Ratliff are the top two in whatever order you want to play them. Brisniak has been rock solid, and you want to keep her at five or six, and she played six here today and got a straight set win. You want to keep her there as long as possible. I don't know how long you can, Jay, because, again, Cole, I love the thought of Coley Allen at five or six. Don't love it as much as three. Like, what does she have as the weapon there to really hurt an opponent at three? I don't know. Obviously, Boulay's still working her way back from injury. She's not what she was last season, not the best version of herself right now. So you hope by the time she's done, maybe she is the clear-cut three. But, like, there is no difference between Allen and three and Brisniak at six right now. And obviously, you've got Danielle Wilson sitting on the bench as well. I don't know. Where are you with these Buckeyes now? Well, not high. Yeah, uh, sure. You know, I think Eight this and is— five overall, by the way, now. Yeah, and they have the most lost points out of any top 25 school right now. That will decrease uh, once UCLA moves up the rankings, right? Not, you know, UCLA probably underranked there at 64. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right. They have a top two that they're probably never going to go 2-0 and against the top teams uh, at 1-2. and I think it's going to be tough. Um, so at best, they're going to go 1-1. One and one. I think they But need they to should find- always go 1-1. One and one. Like 1-1 one and one's the number. I, I mean, again, like... I think one of Contlos and Rantliff, if one of them plays their best, they should win. Against the best schools, it's going to yeah, be I mean, tough, I mean, right? But like, sure, but this, this is relative yeah, okay, fair. To, to like top 10, right? Like, Okay, this is the tier one conversation. Yeah, they I came into this saying. match okay, ranked number sure. four, right? Yeah, so, um, but look, I mean, the, the depth looks good, right? If they can find a way to keep Marzal and Brezniak there, but I just don't think you can, to your point. Um so, uh, yeah, look, that said, Shelly Brisniak is really good. Like, it's just real. Uh, she's healthy. She is. I mean, again, that's why, like, I would I would give her a shot at three. Why not see how her level translates? Yeah, but to that they're part? moving her in the opposite direction. They I just know. Below Marzal. So uh, there's some weird stuff going on. Um, yeah. And it'll, it'll take a while before Coley Allen at three can get down to five and six. Yeah, and look, this Ohio State team is extraordinarily tested. They've played everyone to start this season, and they're an experienced group. Uh, but yeah, no, certainly I think that was one of the more notable results, maybe the most noted upset yeah. of the weekend. Rankings-wise by far. Yeah, just something we did not expect to see happen 
I think the other, probably the second most shocking upset, uh, no, maybe not second most, but has to be on the list, is that Texas splits the Oklahomas, and the match they lost wasn't to the Sooners. You look for the Longhorns, who got a very impressive four, uh, excuse me, 5-2 victory over Oklahoma on uh, Friday. They drop a match 4-3 to Oklahoma State on Sunday. And look, we said it was going to be a tricky weekend taking on these two Oklahoma teams, but... I mean, for this Oklahoma State squad, you know, now 9-4 and four overall, obviously a couple of losses for them to Michigan. They were searching for a signature victory. Well, now they've gotten it. And, you know, for this Oklahoma State team to take doubles point, take the doubles point, excuse me, and then to win all three of the bottom three matchups, four, five, and six is where this experience group pulls ahead from this really young Texas team. A, that's notable on face value. B, talk about quick matches, Jay. All six of the singles matches were decided in straight sets. That like that so rarely happens, especially in four three matches. Yeah, I mean the thing that made this match in particular surprising was the combo platter of what we had just seen from Texas against Oklahoma two days prior, right? Which was a really dominant performance. And I was thinking, okay, this is the Texas, you know, we're starting to get into mid March, going to start to see kick it into high gear. That was not a close match with Oklahoma. I mean, that was another straight set wins at, you know, here in Zainalova, Pascaleva. I mean, they were ripping off the straight set wins. Then they turn around and Oklahoma state sweeps at four, five, and six, all in straight sets. You have Miyamoto at four Rojas at five and Gonzalez, the freshman at six, get the clincher over fellow freshman Nicole Rivkin at Texas. A a really good performance for Oklahoma State, the first time they've beaten Texas since 2017. First time they've done it at Texas since the year prior, the year they made the NCAA final. So uh, you're right. This is a team that needed that momentum, right? Had kind of dealt, been dealt a tough hand early in the season with a tough kickoff region, not making indoors and now has some momentum carrying into the Big 12 season. Mm-hmm. Where are you with this Texas team? To your point, Patch Galeva, Rapalu, dominant straight set wins over Oklahoma the day prior. They take losses to Oklahoma State. Rivkin, the freshman, clearly still a work in progress at that sixth spot. Will be interesting to see if they hold with her, if they go to the Marley Zane uh, lever that they have on their bench. Obviously, you look for Kieran, straight set wins over Sleeth and Novak. She's clicking. At that number one spot, I think Zainalova, Shavatapan have held up fine at two and three. Doubles has been a work for Texas, no doubt about that. You're never quite sure what you're going to see. I mean, th- here's the thing is the room for improvement is so evident. At the same time, I don't know how sure that improvement's going to be in the way it was last year, where it's like, oh, okay, by March, all the freshmen started clicking. This team's not clicking in that fashion yet. Yeah, and it's people that I think should be clicking, right? I think like Patch Galeva, right, should be getting better week after week. Uh, Rapalu has the experience. You know, maybe you say Nicole Rifkin falls into that category of, oh, she'll be much better in May. Well, we'll have to see. But I think the concern would be Patch Galeva and Rapalu just being so inconsistent, right, to go from their matches on Friday against Oklahoma, right, to then losing against Oklahoma State. I think that's a surprise and also losing in straight sets as well. Yeah, well said. And I mean, again, Oklahoma State now is going to be in the top 25. They're just back in that top 16 conversation and plenty of ranked wins still available on the Big 12 platter for them moving forward. You're making a face. Why? Well, uh, tough weekend for the Big 12, though. Sure. Right. And their hopes on having two teams in the top eight, right, by Texas losing this Oklahoma State match and kind of spreading out those points. Mm-hmm. You it would have been have- one thing to lose to Oklahoma, but to lose to Oklahoma State, I think, is the key thing here, right? Because the points get that much further spread. Yeah, Oklahoma doesn't have a ton of points either right now. Sure. But, uh, you know, it's just now, I mean, Texas isn't going to move up, you know, a- at all, right? They're still going to be in this, like, you know, 14 vomit zone. And you just have Iowa State being this one team that, people are are trying to feast off of and bring down, it's going to be near impossible to get two teams now in the top eight. Meanwhile, again, we've talked about the Texas side, Oklahoma State side, Oklahoma. 
tough for obviously they get a bounce back win the next day they uh knock off baylor which they hadn't done at baylor in quite a bit of time so let's, yeah that yeah, was a crazy stat like yeah, 2005 yeah so let's not forget this team is still doing first yeah. as a program i mean my question as it relates to this oklahoma team you know sleeth takes the loss to rivkin uh, to Kieran, excuse yeah. me. Meanwhile, you look for Donna Guzman. She continues to just get better and better. And obviously, uh, she gets a big win over Shavatapan. She then, uh, I believe, also gets the win over Baylor as well. No, right? she does no, not. She, she didn't play? She did not play it. against Baylor. Yeah, okay. So, shout out to me. Uh, good good following there. But, I mean, do you at what, is there any point where you consider moving Guzman up to one? Well, they've already moved her up to two, right? Yeah, and I sure. feel like similarly when we were talking about Ohio State with Contos and Ratliff, I think, you know, Sleeth and Guzman, you're one and two, right? I, I, I don't know if you move Sleeth down, but sure, I think it's an option. I don't think that's where their concerns are, right, with Sleeth and Guzman, right? I think they have much larger concerns down the rest of that lineup. Where in particular? Well, I think you're not getting the production you got last season from Pisareva and Staker. Uh, Julia Garcia, I think, has higher upside outside. So we'll have to see how that translate over the course of these next few matches. But I think those spots in particular and Carmen Corley is not playing as well as she was last season. Yeah, I, I, again, and I think it's all a little bit. I, I, it's all fair. And, you know, again, you look for this Oklahoma team. All the marbles now are almost in the Iowa State. Like, they have to beat Iowa State. They kind of have to beat Oklahoma State, right, if they want to be a top 16 seed. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's now you have some back-against-the-wall matches, and so we'll see how this veteran group responds. Yeah, I mean, for Texas, still young. You get the one-and-one, but obviously for Oklahoma State, a massive weekend for them to get the win. And then, by the way, they quietly got tested quite hard against Baylor 4-3 win for Oklahoma State there now you're making a face I know why but I'll let you say it well that was the strange thing about those uh Friday matches to see Oklahoma State get so tested against Baylor and and Texas kind of steamroll over Oklahoma you would not have expected that Oklahoma State comes out and beats Texas and then Oklahoma without Guzman steamrolls Baylor so uh, weird uh you know calculus happening there but yeah i mean i think if anything maybe they built some belief from that close win over baylor that they carried into austin yeah very well said well with all of that in mind let's talk now about the acc because i think that's where our next upset comes from and look before the season we said this miami group that was a top 16 seed last year they had to go on the road at the nca round of 16 to a pepperdine uh team that was peaking at exactly the right moment and so you know again round of 16 last year for for miami and yet they were right in the hunt come the end of the season and they brought a lot of the pieces back from last year's team you bring back an Achong, a, a Bach Collins a Fenning you add in a piece like All-American Alexa Noel at the top of the lineup as well we thought this Miami team would be in that top 16 maybe even sniffing tier one mix Then they lose in the kickoff weekend to Iowa State, a match that obviously threw us off the scent, but for all the wrong reasons had more to do with Iowa State than anything wrong with this Miami squad. Of course, you know, again, for Miami now, they have one of the signature victories on the year. They had to knock off a Diana Schneider-led NC State team 4-3 in Miami. Now, for what it's worth, they also get an equally massive victory over Wake Forest on Sunday. Now, Wake Forest was shorthanded, so it's not fair to say that Wake Forest played their best match. But guess what? The rankings aren't going to discriminate based yes, on it they being... Will. Yeah, yes, they will. Based NC on it being State, a shorthanded Wake? No, but NC State was like a top five team coming no, into this match. But, but no, I'm saying for Miami, like... They'll take the Wake win, too. Like You're sure, absolutely, absolutely right. Of course, yeah. the NC State's the signature win. I'm saying, yeah. though, Wake was number 17 in the country. Like, Don't knock a top 20 win as well on the weekend, right? They're both significant if you're trying to make a top 16 push, especially, by the way, after the 4-3 win. Like, There's going to be a hangover in the next match, and to see them drop five matches in the three singles victories they needed to clinch was like a joke against, yeah. again, a shorthanded Wake Forest team, but still— 4-3 win. Miami knocks off NC State. They drop the doubles in that yeah. match, Jay. They find four singles victories, most notably Noel 4-1 and one over Schneider. 
Miami's back. Yeah, well, it wasn't just that Iowa State loss that threw us off the set. It was also the Syracuse loss, which yeah, just sure. recently happened. Uh, but that one particularly, there are a lot of extenuating circumstances of having to go upstate New York, play indoors. Well, it's funny you say that because in my head I was thinking, all right, I know they're now 8-2 and two or 9-2 and two overall. I was like, I can't remember what the second loss was. And you're right. It was in Syracuse a couple yeah. weekends ago. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, and this was this was a good a good win, right? I mean, anytime you knock off Schneider, right, who's you know who lost you know both to Georgia Tech and now to Miami, I mean, you could just feel the rest. Uh, I know the first match off, Alexa Noel was the first match off yeah. against Diana Schneider. You could just feel the confidence that get that gave to the rest of her teammates, and you know you saw the straight set wins at five with Mia Mack, the freshman, Maya Tahan at number six was a, a three set win, and then they get. You know, uh, Fenning at three as well over Amelia Rejecki. Look, they have a very talented squad. And, you know, if they can figure out doubles, right, and win more doubles points, then they're going to have a pathway to three singles against a lot of these teams. Mm -hmm. I also think outdoors, especially at this point in the season, we know how tough that Florida trip is, but they've got grinders everywhere in this Miami lineup. And, even if you beat them, it's going to take you three hours to do it. You know, if you're NC State, it was a weird weekend. Like, they win doubles, drop four singles matches against Miami. They w lose doubles, win, I think, six singles matches against Florida State. I mean, again, this NC State is notorious for playing 4-3 matches. That was the story of their season last year. They win doubles. They scrap their way to three singles victories. Again, they're right there in third sets against Miami at the number three position, at the number six position. They win the first sets at those two spots as well. I mean, again, where are you with this NC State team, Jay, uh, following what was, again, a weird weekend of ACC play? Yeah, it's a little whack-a-mole with yeah, NC sure. State where it's like, you know, one issue pops up and then you think you resolve it and then another one pops whack -a up. whack a great comparison by you. Thank you. Uh, you know, so you come in with Schneider, you're like, great, we feel great about that. And now you're like, ooh, that might be a surefire loss, right? Um, Sophie Abrams started the season on fire. She's out sick at the Ohio State match. She hasn't looked the same. Uh, Renchelli has not looked like the player she was last season. She starts getting some wins. I thought it was a good win for her over Buck Collins. So uh, figuring out who plays at six, is it Dittman? It, do you bring in Nell Miller? Like, the, you know, Alana Smith looking good and then she'll take a bad loss. Like, it's just a lot of uncertainties that keep popping up in these matches. It's really tough to feel confident about the team moving forward. I'll say this. Alana Smith's looked good. Like, if you're taking it as a, the summation of what she's done this year, I think seven and two overall, like she has yeah. been very good in her return this year, but you're right. Like Rejecki and Shelley, they never both play well in the same match. Yeah. It feels like like one of them's going to play well. The other one's going to struggle on one day. And like, again, Schneider's still having a really strong start to her season. You look for Diana Schneider so far this year, five and one at the number one spot. If any freshman That's goes not five, updated. Oh, it's not? No, they're ten and one. So she's probably what, six and two now? Six and two, the two losses yeah, to she's Tennessee. She's at least lost two yeah. matches. Yeah, right. six and two overall. You're right. Carol Lee it's, and it's, it's a weekend. Noel. Yeah, it's a weekend short. So six and two. Any freshman six and two at the number one spot, you feel really good about that freshman. It's just she happens to be a top one hundred ranked player in the world. And so, you know, she gets graded on a curve. I still feel pretty good about NC State. Like that win told me more about Miami than it did about the Wolfpack because it gets weird on the Florida trip. It always does. We're going to learn about three canceled flights when I ask Simon about this at some point this year, right? There's always some sort of extenuating circumstance. And yet all this is to me is a reminder that Miami's top 16 good and that the margins between the 16th best team and even the third best team in the country on paper, like the margins are that thin this season. So 4-3 on the road was what it was. Again, has more to do with Miami than anything else. And again, the ACC is just loaded this year. I think it was seven top 30 teams going into the weekend. Now we're recording this on Monday nights. So we don't have the new ITA rankings in front of us. But like, you know, again, across the board, Jay, Duke, a really impressive 4-2 victory over Georgia Tech. Like Georgia Tech has struggled 
in ACC play so far. You look for this Georgia Tech team. I think, yeah, they're one in four overall. This Georgia Tech team's like, they're really good at seven and six. I thought Bill Chev looked great against Mora. Carol Lee versus Chloe Beck looked like two top 10 players in the country doing battle should look. I thought I'm blanking at who beat Emma Jackson at three, but gave Emma. Oh, Jane, Mahawk Jane gave Mahawk Jackson Jane. the business at three. Yeah. And she's been a top 90 player in the country. The ACC spreads out the points. It's great because now Miami gets in on the points with the win over NC State. Duke's getting in on the points. Virginia's getting in on the points. Syracuse is like, thank you, Miami. We'll be in on the points. Yeah. They might have six top 16 teams. Like, can I, can we go through this list real quick and you tell me if I'm crazy? That work for you? Can sure. I get a verb? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah I, I need... It might need to be higher than six, but sure. Well, so let's just talk locks. Is UNC going to be a tip top 16 team? Yes. Yes. Duke, 2-1 and one at the indoors, they have enough, right? They're going to be a top 16 team. Yeah, okay. Uh, Duke, NC State, U- no, no, UNC. I'm going fast. I'm going faster <laughs> okay. here. NC State, yes. Yeah. I'm just looking for a yes or no out of you. Yeah. Virginia? Yes. Miami? Yeah. So those are your five locks. So this is where six gets interesting. Syracuse, Wake Forest, Georgia Tech, like that would be your last three contenders. And Georgia Tech, one and four, seven and six overall. Like you feel like they're capable of doing it. You feel like they could be a top 16 team. I don't know if the math is going to be there. Yeah. Five I think it's probably the number. I think it's just those five because the SEC also has some crowded points at the I top know. of that uh, conference as well. So they're going to crowd, I think, those three teams out. I think five is it. Um, but look, one of these, one of those teams, like if a Virginia, right, kind of falls off, or if Miami has a few bad losses, you know, it, yep. not Virginia, guaranteed. Virginia already beat Duke and Syracuse, so it's like they have two wins. They kind of got the one. Like they, You're right, like they can't lose to a Georgia Tech, but like, I mean, it's it's the conference is really good this year across the board, and again, I thought Duke looked better. Like I know Bryce Golova struggled at five, but Coleman looked really good at six. They win doubles. I think Duke's getting better. Yeah, you've totally buried the lead with Duke. Overall, yeah. they did not look that good. However, having Drummy back in the lineup and winning yeah, 4 0 over is. Cruz at at four is a really good sign for them. I'm just buying stock in Duke when they make their inevitable semifinal run. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, exactly. Chloe back now 14 0 at the number one spot this year, career win number 98 in singles. She's about to hit the century mark. Like, you know, and she's going to do it in four years too. No asterisk, Jay. She's going right. to do it in four well, years. No, there is down. an asterisk because 2020 was a short. Oh, she did it in three and a half. That's <laughs> yes. nuts. That yeah. is historic. Dare yeah. we say that's Keep in mind, folks, watch Chloe back every time you have the opportunity to do so. Is it fair to say when we didn't mention him in the conversation, I think Wake Forest gets eliminated right after losing to both Florida State and Miami. I don't think there's a pathway for them to be top 16 any longer. It no. opened after last weekend with the win over Georgia Tech. Probably closes this weekend, right? Agreed. Yeah. I mean, again, more broadly, I think things look really good in the ACC right now. And, you know, again, just quickly because we're going to use this segment on our ESPN plus ACC Network plus feed, Jay. So I'm going to play a quick game with you. I played with Chris. You tell me just yes or no rapid fire if they're an NCAA team. Now, as we've already established, North Carolina, Duke, NC State, Miami, Virginia, locks to make the NCAA tournament. Is 11-1 and Syracuse a lock to do so? Yes. That's a, yeah, It's hard to argue otherwise. Wake Forest, 11-7? and No, because uh, these are not one word. No. You, you don't have to one word it for that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, Brylin and Killingsworth, both absent. I don't know how serious those injuries are, but that could really derail their season. Yeah, they might flirt with the 500 rule because the ACC is yeah. that good. That was Florida's last six matches. The Florida men are laughable. And it's like they might be under 500. And that's what you worry about with Wake because they've still got the gauntlet remaining. Florida State tournament team. That one's going to get interesting. Yeah. I'm going to go no. Notre Dame, 10 and 4 right now? Yes. Georgia Tech, 7 and 6 right now. Yes. They're going to flirt with that 500 rule. If this team doesn't make the tournament, it might be one of the five best teams ever to not make the tournament. That's how good this Georgia Tech team is. Um, 
to not make the tournament, Jay. Now, that wasn't that grand of a pronunciation. You're not one of the – this team is clearly top 40. Um, BC? No. Clemson? No. Virginia Tech? No. Louisville? No. Yeah, I think that's where things stand in the conference. I don't think I have a strong disagreement with you one way or the other. Other than I'm going to give Florida State the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to say they sneak in. But yeah, that's going to be really close. And that's your uh, update on everything happening in the ACC. Of course, again, we have broadcast for you every Friday and Sunday on ESPN and ACC Network Plus. So be sure to tune into our broadcast. Let's move over to the SEC now, where we had a bunch of other fun results, I thought, throughout the course of the week. Let's start with Tennessee. A team you know I've been on the bandwagon for, Jay. I think they're legit. I think they've got real depth, one through six. And you saw that manifest itself this weekend. 4-2 win over Kentucky, but perhaps most notably the 4-3 victory over Vanderbilt on the road in Nashville. You look for this Tennessee team to drop the doubles point, but get victories from Tomase at two, Kutzer at three, Adeshina at six, and then Molinaro with a really fun clincher over an Anessa. Lee, who had lost just one dual match throughout the duration of this 2023 season coming into it. That's the signature victory the Vols were looking for. They're going to be top 16 in the newest rankings, Jay. They deserve to be. Like, this Tennessee team, they're everything Auburn is. Like, it's the same. I'm telling you they're the same teams, Jay. Like, if when Tennessee plays Auburn, it's going to be seven hours of never-ending tennis. <laughs> I, I, I don't... Know about the Auburn comp, maybe Auburn from last year, but yeah, this is a, is a Tennessee team that has much more experience than this Auburn team. And I think is one of those teams that, you know, you the misses indoors, right? And then kind of goes quietly under the radar. But, you know, as we talked about, like very little drop off between one and six for this mm-hmm. Tennessee team. And, you know, to get that win, the clincher in seven, six, and the third over Nessa Lee of Vanderbilt, who had been their most reliable point just an incredible performance for Molinaro and they're really strong at two three I mean just the the middle of the lineup the lower half of the lineup uh if this is a team if they can sort out doubles right uh they're gonna be really tough to beat well even Aaliyah the freshman goes three sets with their fellow freshman Bridget Stammel who's been a top 75 player at four I think yep. Aaliyah's been pretty solid and look Adeshina and Mertena are top 60 ranked team in the country like they're solid at one you know, Kutzer, Molinaro, Tomase, Elia. I mean, this Tennessee team's only lost twice all year, so obviously their stats are going to look good everywhere. They're just leg- like, they can beat you. They can find four in so many different ways. That's the biggest strength of this Tennessee team. Now, their biggest weakness, is, to your point, I don't know where those four are going to come. Right. Is it going to be doubles? Is it going to be six? Is it going to be three? Is it going to be four? Like, I think Kutzer's going to be there in the mix if we need her to be. Um, yeah. But like, I feel like you bank on one of Tomasa and Kutzer winning. Like you're sure. definitely splitting two and three. Yeah, I think that's And you fair. might get both. Yeah, but again, it's like this team's just a tough out. Like, like yeah. They are good matchups. They're going to match up well at whatever your weak spots are because that's the key. This team doesn't have a weak yeah. spot. Now, again, I don't know what the definitive strength is, but they don't have a weak spot. They're just a tough out. They've been beating who they're supposed to beat to start this SEC season. Then they go on the road and get a really good win at Vanderbilt as well. So, again, credit to this Tennessee team. They're now 11-2 and overall, undefeated to start conference play. You look on the flip side, though, for Vanderbilt. I mean, again, ever since beating NC State ma- making the national indoors, did they sell their soul for that, Jay? <laughs> like, you look for this Vanderbilt team— Two and two in conference play. Obviously, dropped the match to Tennessee this weekend. Also, a tough five-two loss against Georgia. Now, again, in both of these matches, Vanderbilt takes the doubles point, and it's very clear they are, are good at doubles. And Ross and Staff at one, we know how good they can be. You put the weapons of Celia Bell Moore at the number two spot. Again, she could play with you or I. We're gonna have a shot to have success, and then two players who make as many balls as an Lee, Bridget Stamble at three. I like this Vanderbilt doubles lineup. I think they're very Tennessee-esque. Like, I think there's a lot of, we don't exactly, you know, Stamel maybe might be one of their brightest bright spots. Anessa Lee, obviously, what she's done in singles, and she bounces back with a three-set win over Hurdle, the one singles day on the win for Vanderbilt against Georgia. She's the Are biggest we sure stri- that win was over Hurdle? Was that on your stream? I, I, I won't lie. I didn't watch the match. 
Okay. I think it was over Kowalski. And then Hurdle played six? I don't think Hurdle played. I'm pretty sure it was. And it was Grant at six Lop- and Kowalski Lopot- at five? It was definitely Grant at six. I'm pretty, and it was definitely Lopot at four. I'm pretty sure it was Kowalski at five. I think the stats are wrong, but let me, you know, at me. Well, <laughs> I agree. I defer to you. No, you're definitely right. And this happens from time to time. The point is, though, Lee bounces back for a victory. And by the way, 7-5 yes. in the third over Kowalski just it makes screams me. Kowalski. Yeah, right? yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's a great call by you. We're using context clues here, and I would agree with you. It's. I think it's Tennessee. Like, again, maybe those are the two teams that are like Vanderbilt and Tennessee, where it's like, Whatever your weakness is, Vanderbilt's going to match up pretty well there. Their biggest strength is doubles and Lee. I don't know. Like, where are you? I, I, I defer to you. You're making faces at me. Yeah, I, I'm definitely not there with the Vanderbilt where, oh, wherever you're weak, we'll stack up. No, they have some glaring weak spots right now, including Anna Ross at number two, who I'm not sure okay. has won a match since that NC State win. Um, Holly Staff as well has really struggled at three position. Those are two spots that they have really struggled it. And then Celia Bell Moore, it's like 50-50 ball, um, maybe like 60-40. <laughs> well, uh, it's a, the thing is, she's three sets. It's just like it gets so She's going three she, sets. Yeah, yes. it's always three sets with Bell Moore. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> Which is why I don't say it's a weakness, because it's like she's always in the match. It's just like, you're right, right. it's not a sure thing victory. Yeah, it's pretty volatile. So, yeah. no, I, I, I mean, Stamel and, and Lee, I feel good about. Yeah. Other than and doubles, maybe right. But other than that, I think this is a way. Yeah, but that's more, three points. Yeah, but feeling good and locks are very different things, that's right? And when you face up against a Tennessee team, if they can still find four points against you, like it's not good enough on the Vandy side. So no, this has been it's been tough for them. It was a tough weekend. There's no doubt about it for this Vanderbilt team. Who again, that NC State win is going to do some heavy lifting, but they got to get going in the SEC. Like they probably have to beat Florida now. You know, they probably have to get a win over a South Carolina team and all these different teams. I mean, it, they're almost must if they want to be top 16. Yeah, I mean, I'm questioning if Vandy is even in that tier two, right? If you have a tier one wow. of A&M and Georgia at the top of the SEC and you have a tier two of Tennessee, Auburn, Auburn you know, Florida. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, Vandy's 0-1 right now against those tier two teams. So we'll have to see. Absolutely. They, again, are as compelling as any team to watch, I think, the ups and the downs in this 2020. Because, again, 5-2 against Georgia wasn't a bad match. They didn't get blitzed. Um, well, they, they did. I mean, they lost, you know, five singles matches, and a yeah, lot of but, them were in straight sets. Okay, but it, I dis- uh, fair. You know what? I concede. <laughs> I was wrong. The Vanderbilt match, they were right. I mean, Lee 7-6 in the oh, third. Oh, that uh, was like, again, super close. Or the Tennessee yeah. match, excuse me. Like, Come on. Like, again, they win that match. Now they're feeling fine about their weekend. Now it's like, no, no, no. We're back in the top 16 hunt. Like, we're where we need to be. Maybe we're not tier one, which we flirted with for a hot second, but we're back in the mix. Uh, Instead, though, again, it's Tennessee, the storyline coming out of the SEC. Let's talk about Auburn real quick. I mean, again, the Cardiac Tigers. Like, it it shouldn't have come down to 7-6 in the third against Ole Miss, and yet it does, and credit to the freshman, Okatoye, who earns that 7-6 in the third over Zadori at five. You know, you look for this Auburn team. They drop the doubles point. Uh, no, they take the doubles point. Excuse me. Um, I mean, I don't know, Jay. I just, like, I don't know. They Their two wins were 1-1 one one from Arsenal and Bennett at 1-4. It's just like it feels like there's always, first of all, A, there's always going to be a 7-6 first set from Ansari. And B, like, it's just going to be 4-2 or 4-3. I think I was looking and they've played, like, seven matches 4-2 or closer already this season. Yeah, and talk about a team where there's things that are people spiking and other players, not a lot of matches where you'll have like someone in this case, right? Arsenal and DJ Bennett, you know, blow out their opponents. And then on the flip side, you have other, you know, you know, at at six, Adlin Flack getting blown out at six. Like they're never seemingly all playing well at the same time. Oftentimes they get saved by having that one oh advantage going into singles. But look, that's what you get when you have, you know, three Um, three freshmen kind of at the core of that lineup, although it's in some ways some of their bookends. Sometimes Arsenal can really go haywire at Adlin Flack, sometimes not up to the competition at number six. So there's just a lot of um, peaks and valleys with this team, but the consistent through line of it is they're going to fight really hard. And this is a team that when it comes down to those three, three situations, you feel like they're going to win. They've been pretty good at getting three of doubles, Arsenal, 
and Sari and Flack. Like three of those four points they usually get, and then one of the freshmen has to come through. Um, again, this instance, it tilted. They needed a couple more freshmen. They were able to do it. Again, I just did the math. Eight of their 15 matches have been 4-2 or closer. They've played five 4-3 matches. Again, they're 13-2 and two overall. Wow. <sighs> they sovereign team. They like to have some fun. And then Florida, I thought we mentioned why are they tier one. They get a pretty comprehensive 4-1 win over South Carolina in Columbia, Jay. I mean, look, Sarah Hamner takes a tough loss to Dahlstrom, 2-4 and four on the day. But, like, Florida's good. They they are. They're top 16 good. Yeah, and they're competing well. It was a great loss, a uh, great win for Dahlstrom over Hamner. Um, Ayanna Ockley, we, we gave her a shout out last week. She looks excellent getting the two and one win over Carly Briggs there. Tough team, right? They're going to be not an f- easy out for anyone. Four undefeated teams right now in the SEC Auburn, Georgia, Tennessee, and AM. The winless teams are Arkansas, Mississippi State, and Missouri right now. Those are the most notable SEC matches again every Thursday, Friday. We'll have SEC coverage for you on ESPN and SEC Network Plus. Let's blitz through. Oh, go ahead. What I was going to say, say, before we move on, I'm shocked you didn't bring up LSU's 2 0 weekend over Missouri and Arkansas. I thought for sure you would bring that up. Uh, credit to the Tigers for going undefeated this weekend. I don't like to rub it in, Jay. When I'm right, <laughs> I'm right, and it'll prove out at the end of the season, and that's what I like to rub it in. But all right, let's get to the other notable results then because there were a few. Four hours later, Bunyawi Timchaiwat, three sets, clinches a come-from-behind 4-3 win for the Pepperdine Waves at USC. Madison Sieg didn't miss in her three-set victory over Janice Chen. From 3-1 down in the first, Brodus wins her match in about 35 minutes at the three spot over Cayetano. I mean, again, if this is the USC team, we're going to get to see, look out if you face like they're going to do what they did in 2021, which is go on the road and like beat a Florida and beat like a really frisky. I don't know. Maybe it'll be Florida and Oklahoma again. Like maybe that's literally what it'll be for this USC team. And yet Pepperdine, I mean, to drop doubles the way that they did, Jan- Chen and Brodus win 6-0, and yet, again, t- to drop the other two sets, you know, they take, what, the five first sets I think that they need. They sweep first sets at the top five. Oh, no, no, they take four first sets, one, two, three, and five. Tim Chaiwat Charney was just a grind fest, and Tim Chaiwat the fifth year versus Charney the freshman. That's one Pepperdine's got to have. They ultimately get it. Like, I mean, again, she fought off a match point. It was grinding tennis. This match I watched every second of. I won't lie. Like, I just couldn't help myself. I was like, it's Sunday night. Like, I should be watching Indian Wells, but I'm just really not in the mood. I need tennis that I know is going to bring me joy. And I was like, you know what will bring me joy? Sunday night under the lights at USC. This match was delightful. That's all I have to say about it. Do we need more Sunday night lights action? It was I'm- do you know how often I say under the lights college tennis is the best college tennis? Because it's just, here's the problem. Can't do it in the north. Too cold. It's California and Florida and Texas. Like that's the and to their credit, Florida plays under the lights. Texas plays on A and M plays under the lights all the time. Like Yeah, they do. Baylor does it too. Like they the problem is you can only do it in so many places. But I agree with you. If you have a school where you can do it, fucking do it. <laughs> Particularly if you have any hope of going to NCAA final site. Almost always you're playing under the lights there. Okay. Can I – I'm sorry for cutting you off. To that point, because you know the anecdote's coming. If I could do anything different, when I'm on the treadmill having regrets about our run to the Club Tennis National Championship because those who have watched the highlights know Max and I lose our match in that match, it's because a kid from the north, like I am, I don't play under the lights tennis. You never play under the lights in Michigan because it's too cold. And why would we put lights up at a high school when you're not going to use that high school the winter because it's too cold to play outside? Um, It's the single biggest regret I have is I would toss up the ball on the serve and I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like, you're so right about NCAAs. If you think you're going to make a run, you have to – I literally – I'm not going to say what team I gave this speech to, but they were like, any advice for us this year? And I was like, if I could say one stupid thing, play under the lights. I couldn't yeah. agree with you more, Jay. 
Yeah. They, I mean, every year at this point, yeah. right? It's happening under the lights, either because it's intentional or it's because of rain delays. Like it's happening. So it's fun to, I think that's what this evokes, like watching the match. It evokes NCAAs, but this was an incredible college match between two teams who know each other so well. And obviously a heartbreaking loss for USC, just the points that they would have gotten. But I come away feeling really good about USC in this match. They played it without Naomi Chung in singles and they fought so hard, you know, and they won at six. Yes. And they won at six. Um, So I I feel really good about this. And, you know, if anything, they kind of stole doubles. Pepperdine was up four, one at number two doubles. They lose six, four. It was a back and forth match the entire match, but ultimately you come away feeling good about both these teams. Does my Brodus best player in the country take age well following her straight set win over Cayetano? As does my Brodus problem, you know, take. <laughs> because, like, does she lose to Maddie Sieg? I don't know if she does. Yeah. I don't think – I think she's the best player in the country right now. And there are a lot of really good ones, um, seven of them on the North Carolina roster. <laughs> but, uh, again, like, Brodus is that good right now. But, again, that's Pepperdine 4-3 over USC. Heartbreaker, no doubt, for the Trojans, for Charney. Great win for the Pepperdine Waves, no doubt about that. Iowa State survives their test number one against Kansas. Kansas State, they earn victories in both matches, Jay. They are a top-10 team. Like, this is legit. Yeah, they rolled through Kansas, and actually yeah. uh, that was supposed to be the tougher match and then kind of got tripped up a little bit against Kansas State. Kodlachkova lost her first match of the season. Question for Iowa State is going to be how much longer do they keep Knocklo at number one with uh, you know OB behind her at number two, who's just playing fantastic tennis. Kodlachkova, who's only lost one match. I think there's going to need to be a little shuffling of the deck there, but look, uh, I, I said this this weekend. I feel really good about this Iowa State team getting three points against any single team in the country, even North Carolina. Can they get the fourth? We'll have to see. Yeah, very well said. Illinois, 4 3 over Northwestern. I mean, tough for this Northwestern team now, which I think falls to 5 and 8 overall on the year, which is crazy to say out loud because we know a lot of those Northwestern pieces, although they are working in some new ones still. That's a really good win. I don't know how else to say it for this Illinois team. Clinched in the third set by Megan Hooster, 6-2 there over Christina Hand. I mean, Jay, good win, Illinois. Yeah, it's been a tough few years for Northwestern. This is now the third straight year that Illinois has beaten Northwestern. First time in program history. They've won three in a row against the Wildcats. You know, this is now an Illinois team that's hovering in that 25-30 range rather than in the, like, you know, cut zone for NCAAs and this win will help them. Um, and also just the momentum, right, that they get as they start Big Ten play. Yeah. Last note I would have Charlotte over Penn State. I thought that was a good win for a Charlotte team that's proving they are top 35 good. Anything else you would point out? No, that Charlotte match, I mean, tied for program history, highest win uh, that they got. So um, credit to them. You know, they had a really good conference tournament last year. Um, so yep. that was the last one. Can I give one other shout out? Uh, I did give my shout out of LSU. So, yes, yeah. that was my one. Shout out to you, John J. Parsons, who does a better job of capturing match points and tweeting them out than anyone else in the college <laughs> tennis universe. Seriously, though, it's an exceptional it's an exceptional addition to know that it's not just the teams tweeting them out, but anything that's missed, you're going to cover as well. So shout out to you, Jay. I thought you did an excellent job this week showing a lot of the really fun moments. But again, all that said, let's get to our rankings NC State falling. We did obviously have some movement, and here's where things stand. Again, we're doing this without the current ITA rankings, so we can only go over our latest Cracked Rackets poll, and I have to look at the graphic here from Super Producer Daniel Westoff. Again, we have movement at the number one spot, North Carolina, 2 A&M, 3 Georgia, 4 now Pepperdine up to the Ooh. number four spot, 5 Iowa State, 6 Michigan, 7 NC State, 8 Auburn, Nine Ohio State, ten Virginia. Jay, what what's your biggest difference for between your rankings versus our rankings? I didn't have Pepperdine at four. Um, I think I still had them behind Michigan, or maybe you know Iowa State above them. I didn't have them that high. I didn't have Auburn in my top ten. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they're definitely going to be buoyed by that Pepperdine win, and I think I demoted Ohio State out of the top ten as well. 
Auburn and Ohio State out of my top 10 also. I went with the smorgasbord of ACC teams in my 7 through 10 spots. I went NC State. Yes, you lost to Miami, but you have the most non-conference wins, so they're 7. Duke is 8. UVA is 9 because I know UVA beat Duke, but again, whatever, totality of wins. I have Duke 8, UVA 9, Miami 10. Like... And then Auburn's right next, and Ohio State's right there as well in that conversation. I went Pepperdine 5, Michigan 6 as well. Like, again, it's interesting. All those teams, though, pick a a name out of a hat. Like, if – I don't know. If Auburn played Miami, who are you picking? Outdoors. Probably Miami right now. Yeah, that's why I had Miami at 10 because I was like, you just have to be honest with yourself, Alex. And if you can't answer that question saying Miami would lose, you should put them at the 10 spot. And so that's what I ultimately did. But no, not the biggest disagreements. We'll see what comes out on the ITA rankings here this week again a little bit. I will say I had Stanford still in my top 10. They just missed Texas on the outskirts, obviously, right now as well. Um, All right. Rankings aside, let's look at the week ahead. It stays spicy. The college tennis calendar heating up as, again, we get into the thick of conference play. Jay, do you want me to rapid fire or do you want to tell me what intrigues you most? Oh, I can tell you. Okay, uh, please do. So we are recording this early, so we're not sure if the Ohio State Pepperdine match happened. Forecast looks bad. Another atmospheric river here in California. <laughs> But uh, in the Pac-12, I'm looking at UCLA versus USC. This match got a lot more intriguing after this weekend, uh, as well as Arizona State versus Washington. That's a match for pecking order rights in the Pac-12. The big, big 10 match that I am watching is Wisconsin at Ohio State. It's going to be very good. Very good. And look, this is a make or break moment for Wisconsin in terms of are they really this good uh we will find out a lot uh it's gonna be tough for them playing in columbus that will be heavy advantage to the buckeyes but very excited to see that match and then sec i mean auburn's weekend alone is something to circle talk about pecking order within that tier two auburn playing tennessee who's coming off that win over vandy that we talked about and facing georgia so we'll learn a lot about this auburn team this weekend and then the last one i have circled is a Non-conference match, but it's Miami at Texas A&M. Uh-huh. Very excited for this one. Credit to Texas A&M for scheduling Miami, scheduling a tough uh, tough non-conference match. That should be fun. Yeah. A couple I would add to that. Auburn, not just at Tennessee. Auburn's at Georgia. Like, that yep. is a brutal weekend, and we will see this Auburn team tested once again. Um, Vanderbilt at Florida, the aforementioned match. It's this weekend. It's in Gainesville. We'll have it on our Cracked Rackets broadcast on Friday. How about two other less noted matchups that I think are interesting? Well, I actually have three for you, but you know, one of them is just because it's a team. Whenever I watch them play, out, they get frisky. So we'll get to them in a well. Kentucky at South Carolina. Like, Kentucky's just interesting to me. They are clearly, after not winning a master in conference play last season, they're on a mission here this year, so that's one to watch. But two other ones I have for you, Jay. Arizona State at Washington. Two teams I thought were in the same tier, but given Washington's results, like, again, if they're top 16, they're going to beat Arizona State pretty comfortably at home this weekend. But Arizona State's really good. Like, I think that match has 4-2-ish written all over it. The other one I would throw out there is uh, Texas at Kansas because, again, this Texas team has struggled to start the year. At Kansas is a tough environment to play. They took a tough loss to Iowa State last weekend. They'll be looking to bounce back from. Those are the two other ones I would throw out there. Is that fair? Yeah, I mentioned Arizona State, Washington. I'll be curious to see if that's indoors or not okay. because this Arizona State team, I think the only indoor match they played was at Columbus. Right. So yeah. it, we'll have to see there. But yeah, that to me is like, are you maybe the second best team in the Pac-12? This match could answer it. Uh, and then the last match, yeah, I mean, if Texas you think doesn't. Texas rolls Kansas? That's what I'm saying. If they don't roll Kansas. If they Kansas, don't, I mean, then Texas is not in the conversation. They probably have to be dry. I agree. Like, this is a serious moment here. And again, for Kansas, looking to bounce back, let's see what this Kansas group is made of. 
It's a really good week of action across the board in the Division Very. One Women's College Tennis World. And, of course, we will be back next week to recap it all. A shout-out, as always, to the man who makes all the content here at Crack Rackets possible, our super producer, Daniel Westoff, for the f- of any job he does day in, day out. That's right, Jay. We're pre-recording, so I can bring the outro back, of course. A shout-out, as well, to our friends at LS to learn more about their expansive catalog. Just click on the link in the description to this show. Jay, any final thoughts before we wrap on the week? No, I mean, I can't believe we're in the middle of March. This is when all the action is happening. These are the matches we'll be remembering in May. You're so I'm Phoenix. Oh, looking forward you, to it. Oh, I thought you were about to say, you, I thought you were about to rip on me and saying this is the week you choose to go to Phoenix. No, like, but someone's this, a little self-conscious about yeah, it. Yeah, it's because Chris, <laughs> Chris did it to me earlier, and he was like, you're abandoning me on the broadcast. I was like, I'm not abandoning you. I was like, <laughs> I am trusting. You're giving him an opportunity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, all right. With all that said, for the fantastic John J. Parsons, our super producer, Daniel Westoff, our friends at LS, and from all of us here at both Cracked Rackets and the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. Jay, what do we tell our listeners? Hey, great shot. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.